Hello and welcome to the Might Bomb Beekeeping Podcast. I'm Bruce Rodriguez. I know there are many beekeeping podcasts out there, and they're cranking out episodes so fast it's impossible to keep up with them. So thank you for coming and listening to this one. I hope you like it. Today on the podcast, I have Justin Schiffler of Hat Trick Honey. And Justin is a treating beekeeper that I know personally from the local bee club that we're both a member of. And sometimes we get into little kind of arguments back and forth on Facebook. And as usual, we got into another one. And this time we decided let's let's get together on a podcast and just hash it out a little bit. But it's a, it's a good conversation. Uh, I hope you like it. We're going to probably have to do a part two because we left. We didn't want to go on for hours and hours. So we're going to do another part two and just have more focused questions. But... Here you have it, Justin Schiffler of Hat Trick Honey. All right. Um, All right. Welcome, Justin. Okay, so you're familiar with the conversation that that I wanted to talk about. My question is, when you say that treatment-free beekeepers should do should do mic counts and report them. Who, who do you want us to report them to and what good would it do? And and also just kind of why, why do treating beekeepers often kind of try to explain to treatment-free beekeepers so many things about things that they don't really do? Not specifically you, but in general. Right, right. I think I we've talked plenty of times and I've explained like I'm always on the fence between the two groups because I agree with a lot of treatment-free philosophies and I also agree with many treatment philosophies. So I'm always trying to learn and the who to report to. Okay, so there's some national surveys that are, are basically citizen science surveys like the Be Informed Partnership. Um, you know, our state does a, a, a survey every year. Certain clubs do surveys and because I don't think one group's right or wrong either way. We're all trying to reach the same goals. Um, no, no, we're not. Okay, okay we can let me just. That. Sorry if I cut you off. I just um, I want to make sure that I don't let too much get away because I don't have the greatest memory. But we definitely don't have the same goals. Um, being informed par- partnership. I just heard an interview with one of the. I don't know if it's an executive over there or one of the m- main people over there career treating beekeeper no no desire whatsoever to talk about treatment free beekeeping or any selection i feel like it's exactly the opposite of of kind of what you're saying there right and i think there's a reason for that um in that post we we this conversation stems from i indicated there that a lot of the research doesn't go into any anything with uh treatment free because there's nothing to be gained uh, as far as selling something to somebody. So that, that's, that's very apparent. Same thing with, you know, bee venom therapy and benefits of, uh, you know, honey and propolis. It's not, money's not put into the research because it's a natural product, has healthy benefits, and putting the money in the research isn't going to make a fruitful uh, investment for, you know, some, some magic pill or something like that that's going to somehow benefit humanity. So, those, those studies, those studies just talk to beekeepers about their practices and, um, you know, what their counts are and then if they're surviving. Now, I know treatment-free folks hate that word, you know, um, winter losses and surviving colonies, you know, the bees that make it through winter. Um, Hold because on. I'm, Let me I'm just make sure we're clear. What do you mean? Um, what do you mean that we... We don't like the term winter winter losses. I mean, me personally, I don't consider I don't have any losses. I mean, I, right. I have no money in bees, and and I also am very. I always try to be really clear that when we talk about survivors, that that we we're, we're talking about the same thing. A survivor survives on its own, and something that that is taken care of and kind of pampered is not a survivor. So that's why I can never compare the amount of colonies of mine that live into the spring with somebody with anyone else who, who doesn't do what I do. So it's like apples to oranges. Right. And I think, you know, uh, a lot of the TF conversations, you know, also made me realize that, um, you know, these bees are, can be considered life support bees, bees on life support. Um, so the people 
that I currently mentor and people who go to buy bees off of me, I, I just warn them. I say, make sure you're talking to who you're getting bees from and how much life support they've had over the year. Because if you support, those bees probably won't make it. So depending on what your goals are, you need to know where they're coming from. Because I think you and other TF people say all the time, you know, you can't, you can't take treated bees and go treatment free and, and expect of any success whatsoever. And that makes perfect sense. Um, and I think that's where a lot of people get that bad taste in their mouth and start talking really negatively about it, but they don't understand where they're coming from as far I as. I don't know that I totally would say that getting bees from, from a conventional beekeeper can't survive when they aren't their own. I catch swarms all the time with marked queens and that are, that I'm pretty sure from a treating beekeeper. And I do the same thing I do with my own bees, put them in a box just make sure they're clean right and have the right amount of space and very often they survive perfectly fine into the spring like they actually survive with no in, with no propping up or anything the the thing that a lot of us tf people try to nail into people is to just not buy bees to catch catch bees and not be constantly trying to protect an investment so you could have some overwintering some survival with some some treated or just non-tfbs but but then you're risking losing your money so that's why we're just always saying to catch your own bees all right and that's another great message that you don't necessarily hear from the the treating community either because it's more tied to commercial beekeeping and that whole revenue stream so i totally see that angle also um, where were we? Um, well, I, I think we were talking about the surveys. The surveys is, I'm I'm always reading data. I'm always listening to podcasts, always listening to interviews, always reading things, and and all these all the data and all the B science excludes. It seems to exclude the treatment free community because they don't participate because they don't agree with the metrics. It seems, and the metrics being colonies dying over winter and that's a that, that's a sensitive subject to the uh i think both communities you know like treaters who lose colonies feel like they fail and they look at it a lot of times as losing money or, or you know they didn't do you know their their proper stewardship and then the losses of treatment free folks get poo-pooed you know by the the aggressive treaters telling you, well, that's the reason you didn't, you know, have those colonies survive is because you didn't do anything. It is really funny how, how they cover their butt on both sides, a treating beekeeper. When a treatment free beekeeper has a colony that dies, maybe somebody new who only has one or two colonies and they both die, you know, they bought their bees and they don't, they just, what I say is being a treatment free beekeeper isn't just getting some bees and just not treating them. That's not the whole thing. You want to you want to try to catch bees. You do want to select for survivor bees, but but the way the the treat I just say treaters. <laughs> I don't know if it sounds offensive, but treaters will say, yeah, that's why they died because you didn't treat them. But when they're treated bees, when they're bees who are perfectly to the T, given all the treatments, everything you know, might counts just knock down to zero and they die anyway. Then they have their fall, their catch all, which is either mite bombs or you didn't do the treatment correctly. Do you notice that a lot? Yeah. Yeah. There's, there seems to be the excuses. Um, let's say last, last winter I brought in one of my dead outs, uh, to a, to a club meeting to offer it up for an autopsy. You know, so other beekeepers could participate in autopsy and try to figure out why the hive died. Um, this was a hive in a poly nuke, I mean, a, a poly hive, polystyrene hive, so it had really good insulation. And we only went through one of the deeps, and our, our club president, you know, was asking, you know, when I last treated, when I did this, when I did that. And I didn't have my notebook with me, I'd left it in a different car, and I couldn't give him my numbers and all that kind of stuff, but it, it wasn't too partially counted or treated, but I think it might have had one mild hop guard treatment, which isn't very effective at all. I just had the stuff. It was given to me, and I, I used it. Um, 
as, as a test purpose because I never used it before. Um, and it was immediately dismissed as I didn't treat the hive died due to mites, you know, you know, it was all my fault. The, well, the other person doing the autopsy with us was a, a local uh, scientist by the name of Don Coates, uh, a retired animal vet and, and beekeeper himself. And we got to looking longer. You know, we found the original queen on the bottom board with some dead bees. Uh, the odd thing was we found some queen cells in the hive too. So there was some kind of queen event as well as the bottom board of the hive having a lot of moisture. Um, being my first winter with a poly hive, there, there's learning curves, right? Um, should have had more of the top vents open, I think. But there was also some queen event, which could have happened during the last um, inspection by the inspector, or it's something maybe I missed if I you know, didn't do an inspection later in the season, you know, assume they'd be fine. So I did call the inspector up and say, you know, looking through my notes here, there was a queen event. Me and uh, me and Don found a couple queen cells, you know, late that would have started late October. Um, just wanted to let you know it's possible during your inspection that maybe there was some queen damage and they didn't requeen them. And the, the inspector was totally cool. He said that that totally could have happened. Um, you know, I'm sorry. If oh it yeah. Did. And uh, you know, our our local inspector in our region, he, he's, he's a nice guy. I'm not sure who's in your region if it's the same person or not. Probably. Um, initials J E. Correct. Okay. And, um, but I don't want to get too far off. I mean, what, because sure, I, anyway, I want to keep this podcast down to an hour because not, no one likes to listen more than an hour. The whole thing, the whole thing went, you know, mites didn't treat, you know, it's kind of your fault. You need to keep up on your stuff. Well, me and me and the scientist animal vet, you know, we got to look into it and he even took the queen measure, you know, looked at her spermatheca under the microscope, uh, looked like she was well mated. Um, so I'm thinking it's either a moisture issue or there was some kind of, you know, obviously a queen event where she was sick, not laying. Um, they tried to replace her or she was damaged during an inspection. And I don't always like, uh, you know, the finger pointing towards, you know, it's mites. It died from mites. It died from mites. And uh, I've kind of embraced that. I mean, when my bees, certain colonies don't make it over winter i assume it's mites it's perfectly fine that that's what i'm selecting for the ones that that survive with mites i'm i'm totally stoked about the colony that my inspector did a professional mite count on i have it on youtube counting them at 52 mites in a 300 some odd b sample what am i going to do about it nothing i'm going i want to see if it really survives and if it does what can anybody say 17 percent might load and there's the question for you that that brings up uh a good question he did the test like you want you want your bees to have really high mite loads and survive but if you Me? never do mite counts yes but if you I never just do want them counts, to survive i just want them to survive i don't care what their mite counts are just to be clear you know from my my position is I don't care what they have as far as mites, whether they're high or low, that's what they did. And this, this one count will just prove, I mean, that if to be perfectly honest, I probably think they're going to die. <laughs> that's really high, but well, it's, it's nice. I'm going to find out. Yeah. It's nice to know that number and that way over winter, if that one didn't make it. Okay. Like it's, it's, it's information either way, right? Like, you know, that had a high mite load and those bees didn't, cut it either because you know the the disease amount was too high or they just didn't have the immune system to handle it um but the question i have is you wanted to bring up the question just surviving isn't enough that the point behind that statement was let's it, it, even if you don't treat if you do mite counts which i understand it's it's time consuming it's it's breaking up the brood nest. It is invasive. It, you know, it sets them back. If you have the numbers and then you know that colony came out in winter fine, it, it didn't come out, but say another colony nearby had the same numbers and did survive. It's like, hey, you know, 50 mites took off, took out that one colony, but this colony has the, the better immune system, the better, I don't know. The, the, the hygienic properties that allows them to, um, you know, detect the diseased larvae and stuff. And, you know, maybe they're doing a little more hygienic behavior. 
All right, so so we did three mic counts. One one had fifty two, one had two, and the other one had eleven. Three three counties that are pretty much related to one another. They're they're either daughters or granddaughters of my old queen that I no longer have. But the the point that the question that you the statement that you made was surviving isn't enough and and i've heard this a hundred times from from other people it's not you and i'm glad you reminded me of it because i i wanted to address it someone else used their statement is always survival isn't enough they have to thrive it's that's a classic boom, moving of the goalpost and my problem with that is a treating beekeeper cannot even accomplish the first part of that which is the survival so the thriving is a moot point so a treating beekeeper can't look at me and go oh okay yeah your hive survived but do they thrive it's like it's a classic goalpost movement you you understand that i mean how i feel yeah. about that it's you know it's adding another level it's like yeah, saying okay. Okay, so yeah you use a lot of steroids and lift weights but are your muscles you know this size it's like yeah but you're you know you're cheating. So, so again, we're not comparing apples what's the to definition apples here. Of thriving in that conversation, then. Yeah, yeah. So then, what's thriving? Oh, is it a certain number of bees? Is it a certain size of the colony? Yeah, it, and then it just goes from there. Oh, but but then, how much honey did they make last year? You know, then it just goes even further. So, so I make it really simple. I want them There's to survive. Goal. What's that? There's always a goalpost that keeps right. getting added to the uh the list yeah I, I could i could see the frustration there i leave mine but, really simple do they survive with no mite treatments whatsoever that's it and i'm happy thing, with that one thing that bothers me i hear a lot of you know people talk about queen quality right everybody you know and especially in a lot of uh, you know zoom meetings with you know speakers people bring in they hold up they have a picture of a frame with you know top to bottom side to side cat brood with no no holes or anything and they think that's a good thing well you know all all the modern science is is in, is learning more about bees and the surviving bees that have the the higher levels uh, higher numbers of receptors in their antenna are is correlated with hygienic bees that can detect the stressed larvae that, that the mites are, are reproducing in or the disease larvae and they clean them out quicker and they they are just healthier bees right so they're touting queen quality as these solid brood patterns, yet it's displaying zero hygienic behavior. So it, it, it depends what these people are, are breeding bees for, and they're looking for the wrong thing. I mean, how many decades ago were people trying to breed bees who didn't collect a lot of propolis or, yeah. you know, who were so gentle that, you know, they didn't care if yellow jackets were going in and out of the front door? Um, yeah, you see, you see post after post on Facebook where, Someone shows a picture of a frame and they say, oh, look at my queen going gangbusters and holding up a brood pattern. And everybody will right away say, oh, you need to breed from her. Or she's going to be a good one. But you're treating those bees. They're, they have nothing. They're, to me, they're, if you're treating the bees to make them live, they're worthless. <laughs> it doesn't matter their brood pattern, how much honey they make. I'm not a honey farmer. I'm not a commercial beekeeper. I don't care about that. I really love messing with bees and seeing what they can handle. Stupid I'd brood be, patterns. I could care less about that. I've been getting some flack about that recently because in our local club, um, our, our queen cell program goes from using uh, frames of eggs and larvae from beekeepers uh, judgment over, you know, a couple year evaluations of, of a particular colony or genetic line. And they're not taking into account, you know, how much treatment, they need to survive you know I, I keep saying you know bees that need that much treatment should not be propagated um, i know all about that program too i have a very interesting conversation in my messenger very long one with someone who is a big part of that thing who flat out admits that that they're treated queens that they're, they're treated colonies and that what should the members expect for five dollars you know, they're happy. So whatever, really condescending conversation, which you'd be interested to read that. But yeah, yeah. The, I, I get the notifications from them, too. I don't know how to end those notifications, but they'll say these queens are available from Joe Schmo. And then they'll say Mahler cross with Carney something. 
who cares? They don't survive. They're not they're not doing anything good for for is this the species you, of bees. Are you referring to MCBA or CCBA? MCBA. Okay. I was referring to the CCBA. The CCBA oh, is trying okay. to propagate local genetics, whereas the MCBA, they they will bring in some breeder queens and, and try to do this and that to diversify, which two different approaches each club's doing. Um and in fact our the CCBA, my home club, I live in Chester County, they actually started dabbling with AI a little bit. And that seems weird to me too. Um, I had asked Keith Delaplane at a conference, one of our conferences, how long before we, we keep artificially inseminating queens before they forget how to mate? You know, because uh, that, that can be, and he said that can be bred out of an animal. Those instincts of how to mate and how to do this and how to do that. He goes, yeah, how to fly, how to how to orient, how to return to a colony, uh, how to avoid getting eaten by a bird. You know, yeah, all that stuff can be passed on over time. That's why certain domesticated farm animals can't be bred on their own. They they always have to be instrumentally inseminated. Yeah, that, but I mean, but hoping- talking about queens, that reminds me of something. When I was talking with, with the inspector here, we always butt heads. Every time he comes here, we definitely got much better. We had a really good time, (laughs) as good as time as I can have without beer here going through these bees. But just when we were talking, I said to him, who would you rather buy a queen from? Some queen breeding beekeeper who treats all their cons here, knocks down all the mites, has has a 95% (laughs) alive bees in the spring. Would you rather get a clean from them with a fancy name or whatever, or would you rather get a clean from someone, some schmuck like me who lets their bees just get just slammed every year, just gets them punished and keeps the survivors, never props them up and has been doing that year after year and always increases their colonies. What do you think the answer was? From you? No, <laughs> he said he said that he would still get it from the treating beekeeper. And I think the only reason was something about how some deformed wing virus can be passed from the queen through the eggs or something like that. And I, and I just kind of my jaw dropped like, wow, this is why you, you got people who are actually letting these bees take all the punishment they can take and surviving. But people still want to buy from breeders who just treat because they want to save their investment so they can produce honey and sell more bees. It's all about money and greed. That's why they want to keep treating and keeping every damn bee alive. Um, Every colony, just no matter what. I just thought that was (laughs) mind-blowing. I mean, but here's here's another fact. I'm sure you would call me a broken record on this point, too. Is that you know, our what do I always say? Our beloved honeybees are not native to this country. You know there are no wild honeybees, and that's one thing I know. It's about your podcast. You you never say wild. You always say feral. And I think once or twice you corrected people that um, you know since they're not native, they can't be wild, even though they're living out on their own. Well, for um, me, you you could be able. You could use. It's kind of semantics, really. Of course, they're not wild because they don't really they're not native here that we know of i've heard different differing opinions but and also so does that mean that in europe there's no such thing as feral honeybees that they're all wild i don't know because they might have bees from russia i don't know in europe where they are native are there no feral bees well they're they're only wild a lot of people i think a lot of people in beekeeping a lot of people come from like an ag background and you know they since bees are an agricultural livestock, they they seem to, to view them the same exact way as agricultural livestock. You know, every other livestock, you know, they, they get medicine, they get vet visits, they get checkups, you know, they get their tests, you know what I mean? So it's just natural that that they're going to view them as as livestock and treat them the same way you know like they used to some beekeepers used to always just throw teramycin on the hives you know preventatively and who knows what damage that could have had because you know humans we don't take antibiotics preventatively anymore for no reason because that leads to terrible strains of bacteria 
Right. Well, so, I think that's another term that people kind of throw at each other just to push buttons. Like someone will say to me, they're livestock, so you need to, it's always this big song and dance. You need, you took control of these bees, so it's your responsibility. And it just goes on forever um, because they're livestock. But really, you know, they're not your pets. But really, who? I don't even want to get into that semantics back and forth. There are people who have cattle that they have no intention of milking or eating. You know, there's people who have chickens who don't eat the chickens or, or goats. You're, yeah, we you don't can, eat chicken. Yeah, you can have an animal and it can fall under several categories at the same time. You can have a dog that's your hunting dog, a working dog, but also your pet. <laughs> you know, it, it's silly to really, that's just a button pusher for me, for, for people that hard. say that to me. It is hard for people to to tell them to not feel that sense of stewardship. You know what I mean? Like if they're they're beekeepers, they think they're supposed to take care of the bees and that gets confused by some people. Wouldn't you agree? Like taking right. care of them at all costs, you know, is you know, is the treatment worse than the than oh. the disease, you know? I One of those catch twenty twos can be how many let me how many posts are you seeing on a daily basis of people's bees who just took off or they're dead and it's always after a certain type of treatment or whatever i'm seeing it, i don't get delight in that i just want to just reach across and just slap some people and just say like you did all this to hope that your bees are going to make it through winter and now you can't even get to winter with them because you just did all this commercial baloney on a hundred dollars worth of bees that you took a hundred pounds of honey off, you got 10 times your money back and you're, you're trying to drag this, this, this thing and, and yank another year out of them when you could just sit back and, and not contribute to this problem. But, and what I wanted to say, I thought of when you were talking is another button pusher people like to say is, Oh, you're a bee haver, not a beekeeper. And I, I don't really know. I was going to ask you how you like that phrase. Oh, it like, just I cracks me up. You, you ever have someone try to try to insult you with something that doesn't really bother you or that you kind of are proud of? Yeah, I keep bees. I also, I also have bees. It, it's silly. Some bees I do just have. I can't get into them. They're. It just doesn't, it, it's just a, an attempt to piss somebody off. And it doesn't piss me off because most of the time it's some joker who doesn't know much of anything anyway that says it. Um, oh, I, I had don't a know. good reply. I wish I could remember to somebody that said that. And in fact, I think one of the articles I put in our newsletter started out with be a keeper and a haver at the same time. Like, oh, I'm sorry, I'm not remembering how That's I phrased it. So let me ask you a question. I, I know sometimes when I talk to people, they'll say to me, why don't you treat your bees? And I'll, and it took me a couple of years to figure out that, that, the, that I'm not a big fan of the question because it kind of assumes that, that treating is the right thing to do. So why don't I do the right thing? So let me ask you, why do you treat your bees? Why? You don't buy bees. Bees are free to you, right? I, how, what was the second part of that question? Bees are free to you. You you know me. You, mm. I'm sure we've learned from the same sources how to get free bees. Oh yeah, yeah. I consider you one of my um, swarm catching cutout mentors. I've I've hit you up many times with oh, yeah. questions. And you help me out with stuff, and uh, the same with uh, Jason Bruns and and Solomon. Oh, I, I'm always learning. Um, right, no, so I bought bees our first year. Never bought bees again. And why do I treat? I treat to I my goal is to not let that colony die I want to requeen it and and keep that colony because the hassle of trying to store comb and not get it ruined when there's not bees protecting it I think is a is a big driving factor um something Tom Seeley and Ross Conrad um one of their philosophies you know, is the the colony doesn't have to die, but it needs to change. You know, like requeening a colony. Yeah, but that's say, that's that's not what I mean. Um, wh why what I mean I... is why why treat them though at all? 
if you want to requeen them. But requeening them without giving them a chance to see if they live through winter or not or can survive a mite load or, or anything is kind of you're just resetting the whole thing over. It's just like restarting the whole game. It doesn't for me it doesn't make sense. But but why treat them? I'm trying to figure out I want to hear someone say the the reason that I think it is. <laughs> if, if if they're honest, they they will. All right, let me think of other reasons why I might treat. Oh, when I first started, you know, you, you kind of get scared shitless into into uh, all the perils bees face. Like our first one day class we took into for beekeeping, intro to beekeeping. It was almost like a scare tactic. And at the end of it, the guy's like, you know, you you still interested in beekeeping after all this? He lays down all the down and dirty, right? All the perils, all the hard work, you know, all the stings, things like that. And uh, we were like, yeah, yeah, sure. You know, we don't know anything about it. So if that's what's all involved, then that must be what's involved. And um, and then so a lot a lot of us, I think, are introduced that way. Like, that's how it's done. And that's how it's done. And, and it mainly bases that information off of commercial beekeeping because people are doing it as okay. a livelihood. That they one I need. They need that, the money. They need those bees to live to produce for their income. And right. I realized a long time ago, I don't want to keep these like a commercial beekeeper. Yet I still do some of the same things is what you're probably going to say with, you know, treating and stuff. Well, that's um, one of the reasons that I that I have come that I've concluded is the first one is that the person just doesn't know any better. They think that that's how it's done. They, don't, they may not be very knowledgeable of insects. A lot of people get into bees. They don't know the first thing about any insect. They don't know about ants or, or they don't know what an earwig is, but they jump into beekeeping, which is like one of the most complicated insect societies that I know of. And, and they, they're afraid of a roach or a fly or something, but they get a freaking bee, a hive of bees. And they, and so they don't know any better. That, that's the first reason. Uh, the second is, is because they think that they're helping the bees by by acquiring them and then trying to keep them alive. Somehow they they don't understand selection. They this is the reason why we don't release zoo animals into the jungle because yeah they're keeping them alive in the zoo. They're having babies and everything for people to look at, but they're not the same thing that's out there living on its own. And then the main reason once those two are removed, once someone has a little bit of experience and knows about insects is honestly, it's greed to protect their investment. Or maybe there's a nicer word. I just can't think of one as far Absolutely. as commercial beekeepers and sideliners, it's greed flat out. But if it's a, just a, you know, a hobbyist with a few hives, it's just, they're trying, they don't know that bees are free and plentiful and can survive very often without all that stuff. But with someone like yourself, I just wonder, you have access to so many free bees getting swarm calls, doing cutouts. And you know, in our area, we were giving bees away, like trying to, I couldn't give bees away. So many people had splits and swarms hanging in their yard. They had no, nowhere to put them. Bees are free and everywhere. Why, why hold on to them so tight with these silly rounds of OA and Formic and all this I don't even know all the other ones. Help well, me understand. <laughs> I'm not a virologist, and I'd love to have somebody speak at a bee group to try to explain it, because I don't understand how diseases vector and immunity responses build up and how something can adapt and build immunities. So in my mind, I'm not trying to kill all the mites. I guess I'm trying to help. You know, beekeepers want to feel like they are needed by their bees, right? So that leads to, you know, no. treating and doing a lot of things, right? They, they, they want to be they want to be needed by the bees because they you know, want to be sciencey. I think I think I've I've made up that word sciencey. They want to do sciencey things with with measurements and tubes and and acids, and they want to really think they're being like in seventh grade science lab class that i think that's what they they love talking about it they just want to be extra sciencey when they could just embrace simple you know evolutionary biology which has millions of years of evidence and and any type of selective breeding 
and they could just embrace that instead of all the fake, you know, chemistry and just science experiments just end up with a weaker organism at, at the end. That, that's my thought. But you were saying the people, the people want to feel like they're needed by their bees. Sure. It, there's, there's a relationship there that you want to build. You want to be needed and liked by your bees. Okay. But no bee likes their beekeeper. Like that's, that's just a fact people need to get over. They don't love you. Even though supposedly some studies say they can recognize faces. I think my bees are calmer when I'm by myself. If I have new people with me, they do seem to be different. I don't know if that's something I'm imagining or something that really happens, but um, you know, there's, I guess that's anthro. I don't, anthropomorphism i can't, say, I can't uh, oh. say that word properly but uh yeah yeah they want they want to be involved more you know because they understand bees when they you know they live in a tree that's thick they're putting them in these stupid little boxes you know with crappy insulation and we're stealing their food all the time because they're little hoarders and they they'll collect as much as possible so yeah they've been doing that for a long time though we've been doing that for a very long time they're they're yeah. kind of getting they're they can live in in the thin boxes. I would love to have all my bees in in a six inch thick box or or a round trunk that I can just leave alone. Really, I don't I don't like taking honey off. I hate extracting honey. I'm not a salesman. I don't like dealing with that. But but my question is just with so much bees available to you for free, why why bother with the treating? Why 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 not just say you can select for the true survivors, split them, and keep catching swarms. Why the treating? <laughs> I need to understand. Well, I think that the first comment I was alluding to has a big part to do with it. Um, okay. I hate dealing with dead outs because I don't want to have to bring the comb home, freeze it, store it in a container so the wax moth don't destroy it. Um that that's one of my, I, I think I dread that more than extracting. You know, I have a good dozen supers at home to extract and that is a process. Um, it can be a hassle, but the dead out, d dealing with dead outs and cleaning them out, I think is one of my least favorite things to do. Um, the first time I lost a hive. Okay. Went in the first winter with four hives, lost one. Oh, I felt terrible. And it was heartbreaking. I did something wrong. I wasn't doing what I was supposed to do. I was too new. Um, you know, all those like little guilt trippy things a lot of new beekeepers have. You know, you have these little little bugs and you're supposed to take care of them. And and if there was something that you could have done differently, you should have. And it's your fault they died. So I think people take a lot of personal blame for when they die. Um, I guess there's guilt there too because, uh, you know, you're you're stealing their food which to some degree you feel a little guilty about. So you want to help them. You make them, you know, you give them some syrup if they're not heavy enough for winter. Um, I don't leave supers on anymore just because I'm not dealing with brood in the supers and mixed fall and spring honey. I like to keep it separate. They have different varieties of honey. Um, that's something we like to do. But if I'm getting so, this, if I'm getting this correctly, you, you treat so that you have bees to occupy combs that you don't want to store. Is that what I'm getting? That's, like, one that's the, reason. the reason. That's <laughs> one of the reasons. But, but I like to know. I like to know what's going on with the colony. You know, I take way too long when I do my inspections. Um, it's I enjoy going through a, a hive and crushing very few bees. I pride myself on that. I like to keep them calm. And I like to just see the progression of a hive, where the brood's moving, where the brood nest is uh it's going to this side of the hive or oddly to the west side of the hive or, you know, some colonies put all their brood in the front of the frames and all the stores in the back half of the frames. It's just, that's interesting to me to see all the variety in the bees. So I like to know what's going on. And me too. Even though it is time consuming to do those mite counts, um, it just gives me an idea of how those bees are and what they're doing. Um, let's see, I guess, I guess another reason maybe I treat is like I told you the other day, that one hive, I got a, my first sugar roll, a hundred mites. The second, you know, it takes two shakes to do a sugar roll properly from all the sources I, 
have um, the second shake was 15. So 115 mites in that one hive. And that was my strongest hive coming out of winter. That was a cutout from the year before. Um, and if most people don't know cutouts, you know, you charge money to do their hard, it's hard work. You know, you usually charge several hundred dollars. So, you know, you made money getting those bees. So it's not like you have to keep them alive. Um, I didn't do any treatments on those bees when I, I took them out of the, the building and put them in my home yard and relocated them to a different bee yard early in the spring uh, because that bee yard had only one survivor out of the four hives there. So I moved that strongest hive to that location. And um, I did one mite count in June and I got a sugar roll of one. And I somehow, it just fell off my radar because you know, life gets in the way. You get busy doing other things. I did not check them July and August, or was it in August that I got the, uh, no, no, it was early September. I got that high count of, of 100 plus um so yeah I, I threw I threw some mite away quick strips on that hive to to knock down those mites uh i look at that i think there's i don't necessarily agree with blaming everything on mite bombs because i, I tell people all the time as the bee population declines in the fall mite populations are going to increase because they're still reproducing and there's less cat brood for them to be in and hide in so of course your numbers are going to go up do bees go and rob out dead out colonies? Sure. Can they pick up some mites from dead out colonies? Sure. Sure that happens. But I don't believe blaming every loss you have on mite bombs or just high numbers on mite bombs is the, the end all scapegoat too, I hear all the time. Yeah, well that was another conversation I had with my inspector. I asked what um why do I have so many bees that colonies that survive last fall I, w I went into winter last season with around 70 colonies i don't remember the exact count it might have been 70 on the dot might have been one or two more or less but i had 45 survive true survivors out of all out of that many 45 came through very healthy swarmed like bananas all over the place in my heart i am immediately went from 45 to 90 just from them swarming and doing some splits. And then I still had to go catch all these swarms and basically give them away or, or have other people come get them. I brought some home, sold some to where I'm now high, have a higher number of bees than I did last year, which I would have had anyway, had I not caught a single swarm or did a single cutout. My, the inspector said to me, well, you probably do okay because, because you're in an isolated area with not too many beekeepers around here. And I said, but I have enough colonies to, to give to plenty of people around here. I have my own community of bees here. I'm not isolated. All these bees are together. So th the excuse that maybe you're isolated or you're not isolated it doesn't hold any water with me, especially if you're going to catch free bees. If you're in a very unisolated area with a ton of beekeepers, you should be able to get a ton of free bees. And if and you're not. Talk, at another talk, Keith Delaplane had a nice conversation about yard immunity and how each bee yard starts to develop its own immunity with the, the mites in that area and the diseases present in that area. And, um, talks about a couple studies suggesting that you don't move your hives from one bee yard to the next because you're interfering with that yard immunity. And I thought yeah. that was an interesting aspect. You know, you have what you said, a hundred colonies on, on your, your, your property there. No, right now I have about 82 here and then I have some at another location. And then I have partnered colonies with probably 20 people who I gave bees to and just said, Hey, these are your bees. If they survive, let me get a little swarm out of them or a split or something. If they don't, I'll give you more next year. That's just a few less that I have to take care of. They're spread all over the county um, with a whole bunch of people. So I have a ton of bees out there <laughs> that I don't even have to take care of. And the only agreement is don't treat these bees. If I see, <laughs> see you posting somewhere on Facebook asking about treatments or talking about something, we're just not going to be friends anymore because I only ask one thing. 
I'm giving you free bees. Like, just let's see what happens. So, so yeah, I have access to a ton of bees. But when people yeah. ask me about losses, it's like my, my numbers have only gone up every year. So I don't actually have a loss. I'm never, it's not like the stock market where you can put a whole bunch in and end up with less. I'm constantly getting more. That's what turning down a lot of bees. But now you you said about the isolation. A lot of the a lot of the prominent figures in treatment free beekeeping are somewhat isolated. I mean like Leo Sharashkin, Solomon's out there, you're you know, somewhat out there. Um the only guy I ever met personally that's not is I think Craig. So I like keeping an eye on Craig and seeing you know how how he's working out being in the city that's very you're interesting talking about he's talking about craig mac corkle from liberty bell beekeepers um yeah, yeah, yeah i just I, I just don't uh, buy the whole isolated or not isolated thing because yeah. the, the the common saying is you know it doesn't work in in crowded areas in the urban areas and but what doesn't work what do you mean that it doesn't work that you can't have a bulletproof line of bees that treatment free beekeeping can't work in urban environments. That's that's the what everybody says, right? Okay. I've so let's that let's maneuver. Let me let me let me uh address that one. Treatment free to keep bees without treatments, you can do anywhere. You can you can ha- you can have bees and not treat them anywhere. They may not survive. They may survive. But the the key thing is to not buy bees. So if I'm in Philly, I can keep bees without treating, and if they die, they I can always just keep getting more. That's the thing. I'm not contributing to propping up shitty bees. I'm giving them their their opportunity to survive or not, and then I get more until I get a couple of winners. Treatment free bees can be can be done anywhere. If you're, it doesn't matter if you're isolated or not. I just want to make sure. I think you made this point. The before, treatment free I... beacon can be, can be done. <laughs> now you may not be able to produce a line of bees where they survive all the time, but you're still beekeeping. You're still not treating. You're still getting wax and honey and having kind of some fun maybe, but maybe you don't have some survivors, but we can't all have that. We can't. If you're in, if you live in Georgia in the middle of a package, um, town where, where there's a bunch of commercial beekeepers and they're all propped up junk bees you should be able to get a ton of bees you'll never probably keep any of them alive over winter but you're still keeping bees without treatments. Now, another common theme though is your average hobbyist beekeeper you say especially in the city can't have eight colonies or more to you know account for losses and propagate from so how do you tell those people to you know the rule of thumb is you have two colonies that way you can have resources from one to give to the other you have something to compare to especially if you're new um it's really hard for those beekeepers because they lose 50 percent of bees that's one out of two they lose 100 percent of the bees they lose both bees and a lot of a lot of beekeepers get discouraged you know when they have loss after loss they feel like they're not cut out to do it because Okay. It's not for everybody. I, I hate this idea that that when somebody gets bees and they, they feel discouraged and they don't like it and they quit, that that's a bad thing. Bee keep, bees don't need us. And and if you're only keeping two colonies in the city, the city, I don't know a city that isn't rife with bees everywhere. Um, If I can catch a hundred swarms and I'm just a regular person with, with, with plenty of responsibilities, full-time job, if I can catch a hundred, Anybody can catch two. And I, I'll say that to anybody. F- tell me someone in some town that isn't in Alaska that can't catch two swarms <laughs> by putting out the effort of getting their name out there, setting some swarm traps, talking to beekeepers who might have too many bees Ooh. like myself. I, I coordinate swarms and cutouts all the time for people because I get so many calls. Um, so I'm, I'm pitching out bees left and right to people because i don't want any more myself but you know those those newer beekeepers right okay so one they should be studying for a year and shadowing people so they learn a little bit about it before they jump into it but then say they only have two colonies and say say they were trying treatment free out 
and they they lose their bees because they're not getting good stock or they're maybe they're just not good beekeepers you know bees can die good genetics can die too from bad beekeeping oh yeah um, there's definitely that just just like you said earlier you know bad bees can accidentally survive too on their own there it, it can swing both ways but these beekeepers are feeling like they're I mean, they would have to start over every year. You know what I mean? They, they come out of winter. They don't have bees. They yeah, but they only have food. two colonies. They only have one or two. They, they right. should know that coming in, that even if you treat your bees, you can lose those two. They, they know that. They need to, first of all, know that. Know that you can lose them both. And then stop buying them. You're in a freaking city or wherever you are. You should be able to catch two measly swarms. It's easy. But there's the and, thing. See? The, the, the common thing taught is you have a better success rate of your bees surviving if you treat, no. which leads me back. I, that's, that's what it says, right? It says right. that because there's not data from the other group that's being factored in. That's why I make those comments that annoy you when I say I wish treatment-free beekeepers would just participate. Like, let me ask you this. Why don't you do mite counts? It's not treating. But is it just time? Um, like, no. like you said, I did three just as a, you know, he kind of really wanted to do it. And I thought I would do it. I, I hate doing things because of people bugging me to do things. But I said, you know, let me just do it. Why don't I do my counts? I think I, I think I'm pretty clear about it because I don't care about whether bees die or not from mites there's plenty of other things that can kill bees they can starve they can they can be mice in there they might have who knows what else uh, only once we ignore them and just like we did with tracheal mites um and a few other things only once we just say listen we got to just let them purely survive will will we get to do any kind of improvement or getting past anything and I'm way past it. I haven't done them. I never did a mite count in 10 years until a couple of weeks ago. I've never had less colonies in one year than I had the year before. I've never had less fun in a year. I mean, I'm, I can't see any reason to do it. What, what would be the benefit? I have plenty of survivor bees. I'm always never, swimming in bees. I don't know if you can tell by now, knowing me and all the questions I always ask at meetings online. I'm always bugging people, right? Always asking questions, always trying to learn. So I have this super inquisitive mind. You know, like my wife comes home from work, talks about different patient cases, and I ask, well, did you ask this? Did you ask that? And like, she never thinks to ask things. So she, someone had mentioned before that I'm just very inquisitive. I, I want to know things. So I guess there's a nosiness there that okay say i decide to go treatment free and like i said i don't treat all my hives um oh um okay but i do treat some so you can call me what you want but well here let me I just was, quickly say let me quickly say i agree with a lot of vegan philosophies okay i think that it's great or vegetarians but but i can't say that i'm vegan except I eat a little bit of fish here and there or that I'm a vegetarian, but I only have beef on Monday that the, I think it's a pretty good analogy that, that, that what I do and what many people do is beekeeping completely without treating. So, so in the same way that if you eat a little bit of meat, you're not a vegan or a vegetarian. If you treat a little bit or mostly, but not all the way, not all the way, there's just not a middle ground fair enough but, fair enough and, and i agree with the statement either you or someone said before that it should just be called beekeeping and the right. other group should be called treater treating beekeeping right um right but, but you were saying about inquisiting being inquisitive oh if if, if it were to to swear off all, all treatments and um i would still do mite counts just to know um like, hey, okay, the bees can survive with super high mite loads because some bees just have the immune system response or they have the hygienic behaviors to handle it. And uh, that, that, like, kind of knowing why I think is important and would dictate what I propagated and what I would sell to people. Um, 
because you know i've bees that overwintered um but say if they like the one colony i had two had super two supers on since danny lines came out they didn't put a lick of honey in the supers um but they filled up their brood nest and swarmed at least once now like i wouldn't sell that to somebody and if i did those bees i would tell them listen these bees didn't make any honey and and they swarmed and they filled the, you know the brood nest so are these bees you want um i would want to know the mite counts just to, to just to see how or why they are surviving like that's I don't know if yeah, I'm I wouldn't it. do it. it, when, it I, when I said just it, surviving isn't enough, like surviving and knowing it's not, I'm, I'm, I don't think I'm moving the goalpost. It's, it's knowing more why and how they're surviving. Cause you know, you might have bees that keep their mite population super low and are super hygienic. And you're, you're not actually having bees that um, have really high mite loads that are surviving. Cause there's something, there's something different about mites and the diseases they vector compared to tracheal mites, compared to nosema, which is like one thing, which is one thing. It's like all these diseases and the holes oh. they put in the bees make them susceptible as if we had a big portion of our skin missing. So there's something in my mind that's saying if, if you can like lower mite populations in my brain, it makes sense that the disease risk or the amount of what's the term titers they use a lot and i'm not even sure what that means yeah i can't even um, get into that sorry it's, if it's, it's if 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 the mite numbers were low then the bees might still be getting exposed to the same diseases in less amounts and maybe then their immune response can mm. uh, respond more effectively rather than getting overwhelmed yeah. i'm not sure how to I, describe I, it I, I, I talked about this a little bit on a YouTube video where I said somebody was trying to give me all these reasons why my bees survive. Uh, they swarmed a certain number of times. They did this and that, maybe this, maybe this other thing. They just came up with these crazy speculative reasons that I, that totally drained the life out of me. I could like, it was sorry, but it was just happening when you're, when you're talking about that. I just, it's so, I can't deal with that, but you're an avid podcast listener so i know you heard this podcast a week or two ago where they had uh the guy who's a long time he's like a fifth generation commercial beekeeper it was either beekeeping today or or two bees in a podcast or something like that i can't tell them apart they both sound exactly like the real Did young you hear guy. that one yeah he yeah. was real young and he talked about how when when tracheal mites came on the scene which i thought they came i i had no idea i thought they'd been around early like in the 20s or 30s and that was a long time problem they only came into the united states in 1985 after viral mites were probably here or right around the same time but he talked about how expensive it was to do all these treatments and how some of them weren't, weren't working and that how it just wiped out whole yards and of a commercial beekeeper of so you're talking hundreds or maybe thousands of colonies getting wiped out by tracheal mites so I can't say that that tracheal mites were any less of a problem than viral mites are, because. And then, of obviously, what happened? People just stopped treating, or they couldn't find one that worked. And now, who even bothers with tracheal mites? No one. No one does. So I don't. I won't buy that that viral mites are special. That they're more destructive. They're not. They they would probably be much easier to move past if we did the exact same thing like they did in South Africa. Um, what was her name? Uh, I don't know how I forget her name. Very prominent beekeeping scientist. Very nice lady. What was it? Maria or Mary? Oh, God, I'm blanking. But she told Marianne me about Fraser? Mary Ann Fraser was telling me how she went to Africa with a bunch of beekeeping scientists when Veromites Ver first hit there and they were all scared and nervous and they and she and her team told them not to do anything to let let the bees select for resistance and they never did and they don't worry about them over there and i said to her well why didn't you do that here you know and she 
tell me? Well, because of the commercial industry. That's why. That's the that's the main reason. Yeah, so, almost everything serves the commercial beekeeping industry. Yeah, that, that seems. Yeah, that's yeah, a whole other all, topic. All fingers point back to to commercial beekeeping, where you have to keep them out alive at all costs because it's it's your income, it's your service, it's agriculture. You know, it's 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 all so, those things. Um, but but talking about the you know traco mites was is a great example of how people treated, spent tons of money, got nowhere. Um, but traco mites also didn't vector all those diseases. Um, and you know, th- th- they didn't track they a didn't disease need like deformed wing virus that keeps, you know, mutating, um, pretty rapidly according to the, according to the research. Um, yeah, yeah I, I don't know. I, I wasn't really around then. Uh, I mean, I was around, but I didn't have bees then when that was a problem, but, but let me just say, we're getting close to an hour. So I thought of a question that I want to ask everybody that comes on to talk to me. And I want to make sure that the commercial beekeeping industry doesn't cloud the answer. So I, so instead of saying, what if everybody just stops treating bees? I want to say in kind of like a not <laughs> such a doom and gloom way, but what if humans were completely removed from the equation and all bees everywhere were just suddenly left untreated and unmanaged? Would the bees go extinct? Like, how do you think that would play out? Oh, all of nature would be better if humans were out of the, the equation. No doubt. But honeybees specifically, do you think very many of them would die in the first year? Honeybees specifically. Because um, that's kind of what the show's if, if, about. If the, if the humans left the planet, um, all the weak bees would die, yeah. Yeah, a lot of bees would die. Would they die off altogether? Nope. Not at and, all. And, our, then, our past club president, he one time said, if we would have just not treated from the, the start, we would have been past this by now. And that was really surprising because, you know, he's a sideliner with, um, you know, over 100 colonies and has, you know, his regiment schedule. Oh, the South and, African and, uh, guy? Yeah, yeah. He, I mean, he's, he's a good beekeeper. He keeps bees alive. He gets, yeah, I he heard gets... his thing. I heard his speech at the club. Oh my god! I just wanted to just scream. I was hating every minute of it. It was terrible. He should. It's come involved. On oh, he's, he's. I I couldn't stand his every just treating just a hardcore bully treater. Yeah, I know what you're talking about. Um, um, yeah, he's he's like a commercial. He's he's very much like a commercial beekeeper. He's um, very proud of saying that he keeps a hundred counties and every single one survived. He said, I remember him saying that he didn't have a single. Loss is what he calls it, um, but he yeah, doesn't yeah. have a single survivor. That's the problem. He he has a hundred patients that he kept alive on life support into the next year that he gives to you know he sells yeah. to people. Do you remember that meeting? You remember that meeting? He called me out in that meeting saying, uh, "Justin says we talk about mites too much, so let's move on and talk about this or that." And uh, even I think even in our newsletter he wrote that. And in one of our meetings, he said that too. All right, Justin says we talk about mites too much. Um, so yeah, I, I get some grief about that as well, even though, like I said, I have a foot on both sides of the fence. I agree with philosophies from both sides. Um, and I don't know what the right way is. Um, like I said, there's the whole there's the whole disease, you know, vectoring and stuff like that, that kind of blows my mind. I'd love to hear a virologist or, or somebody like that try to, look at beekeeping and explain well listen if you do this or if you don't do that these are what's known to happen or most likely to happen and but you don't really need to why why do you even need that you can just look at evidence all around you of pests and plants that no longer you know react in any way to anything we do to them and they only get stronger and stronger and then and how do they do that by having the susceptible ones die and the unsusceptible ones, you know, creating offspring. It's, it's such a simple, it doesn't get any easier than that. Just now, could, it's not, it's, do it's you ever, selection. do you ever think it's, do you ever think it's futile because of how many colonies there are in the country under commercial beekeeping care that will 
uh, right. treat oh. treat without even counting and just treat proactively and propagate whatever genetics will stay alive. To well, this is something done. that I think of. This is something that I actually think of. I'm glad you remind me because I always forget. Sometimes I think maybe I should be careful what I ask for because I might get it. And I mean, I'll never get this. So yes, it is futile. But but do I really want all the commercial beekeepers to stop treating and actually having survivor bees to where they don't really die as much anymore? Can you imagine how buried in bees we would be after the initial major crash of bees? And also, if think when I think of the question that I asked you, what if we stop treating bees? The price of bees would actually skyrocket. There would be fewer of them, which would benefit a lot of people. Honey would be in less supply, which should should have an effect on the price of it also and bee products, unless we just keep importing a bunch of junk all the time. But yeah, I don't think commercial bee groupers are ever going to get it. They have no incentive whatsoever to, they, they don't, they do not want to sell bees to people that, that they don't need to keep buying every year. That makes no sense. They, so it's funny when we, when people order from these big queen breeders, Saskatchewan, whatever all these silly, silly names are, ankle biters, um, they think they're actually getting something that's going to survive on its own. They're never going to, that, that that's not good business sense. So no. And to me personally, I don't really care because I always, I always get to keep bees. I'm going to keep them till the day I die. I'm going to always have them for free. I'm not, but I can rest easy knowing that I'm not contributing to, to what all these other people are doing. And I'm not going to push it down anybody's throat. If they ask me, I'll talk to them about it, but, but I'm just, I thought yeah, you were going a different direction. I don't direction think it's going to happen. I thought you were going to say after the initial crash and the bees that, you know, the, the true survivors kept propagating, kept propagating, that bees might actually turn out to be a, a problem. Like too many yeah. bees. No, I did you say know, that. The, I said uh, we'd honey, be up to honey. our necks in bees. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Yeah, I thought, I thought that's where you're going with that. That's why I think that this whole fairy tale about how beekeeping used to be in, you know, 50, 60 years ago, 100 years ago, like uh, you were at the meeting where Vince – Dr. Vince uh, talked about how, oh, we used to have 200 colonies go into winter. And if a single one of them died, we had a whole funeral for it. You remember that? Like, he did this big yeah. dramatic story about losing one colony out of 200. And I just sat there like, are you kidding me? Do you know how many colonies 200 turned? This is before any any type of diseases, you know, except for AFB. But, but can, you know how many colonies you can make out of 200 and then... And then the next year, they all survive again. And then how many can you make out of those? 600 or so? I think it's a joke. That I think it's a fairy tale and totally, totally revisionist history that, to say that, that for so many years, so many beekeepers, just all their bees just lived every winter. They just all always lived. And then what? They just never split them or they never swarmed? Like, where did all the rest of their bees go? And, well, and if you listen to podcasts, you remember... There was a recent one, I think it was two bees in a podcast where the guy said, and he's an actual professor, you know, bee, whatever. And he talked about how he can't find any records of survival rates before, before the 1990s, not, he can't find any. And he was looking for him because he really wants to show how, how just, it was so carefree and fancy free beekeeping and everything lived all the time. You can't find any records. So anyone who tells you, oh, my grandpa kept bees for 100 years and never lost a colony, they're full of shit. And I'll say, show me, you know, let me see those records because I don't believe it. Well, so, so you're saying data is important. And maybe I'm that, saying, so that yeah. data, the data what didn't start to get recorded until people started having a lot of losses to try to figure it out. That that could be possible. Or, you know, there is a little bit maybe rosy. um Oh, looking yeah. back when it was easier, you know, like everybody, what, what Tom Fuscaldo, that, that old gentleman who talked about um, apitherapy over New Jersey, you know, he talked about uh, him growing up. Everybody had a beehive in their backyard because that's where they got their honey from. That's where they got their sweeteners. Um, yeah. And that was back and, when they were killing their bees to get the honey out, like, you know, before Langstroth. But, you know, I don't think everybody 
get everybody in town had a beehive in the yard. I don't think it was that popular of a thing. Yeah, yeah, looking Thanks back with rosy eyes, but um, but that's that's. I mean, it well, sounds here, let me tell you this. It, but some stuff was different. I mean, it, it it sounds different from almost every account where there's just more losses now. But one of the most stark things, Christina Grosinger out of Penn State University. She had a graph. I was sitting in one of her lectures and she had a graph um, talking when mites showed up in the, in the 80s and in the in the States. And when this disease was discovered and that disease was starting to be witnessed. And the huge drop off, the huge, distinct, clear drop off, call it the, the straw on the camel's back. When, when, when all the colony losses started happening was when neonicotinoids were approved and started getting used. And I asked her, I talked to her after the lecture was we were walking to lunch. And I said, that's so stark. You, you didn't call it out, but that was either the main factor or the, the straw that broke the bees back was the year that the EPA approved these, these um, neonicotinoid chemicals to be used in commercial agriculture that all these, you know, crashes started happening. She goes, that's what the data seems to point to, but well, no one wants to listen to it. Well, you know, to, to talk about neonics and maybe Roundup or anything like that, that that's a different conversation. Um, but I, I just thought of um, Brother Adam has some books if you read his the one that i have i forget beekeeping at abbey buckfast abbey he talks about how years where he lost 80 percent of his bees over winter and and where his yards were wiped out by whatever weather or starvation that just came to me i remember that reading that book and thinking wow look at this guy losing 80 percent of his colonies back before anything you know Hey, what was that? Uh, that early 1900s, late 1800s, his time right. period. Yeah, I think it was from late 1800s to early 1900s. But, but yeah, the, I think that's it's a joke to say that that just all the and and you hear new people saying it too. That's what really pisses me off when some clown who's only had bees for you know a very short time tells tells me or somebody else how how things were in the 60s. And they and they don't even know what an earwig is. So yeah, yeah, a lot of a lot of things. But um, yeah, we're right over an hour here. Um, maybe we can do this again if if uh, if you think of some other subjects. Um, oh, is there sure. anything you want to say? Uh, in in the opening, I'll tell tell them. You know, you your your uh, business is Hat Trick Honey on Facebook. Hat, hat Trick Honey. Yeah, hat, we're Hat Trick players. Honey, like the hockey. Loves the hockey, um, and I'm sure everybody's. You're in a million groups. I mean, you're in every group I'm in, plus probably a thousand more. <laughs> so you really you, out there. You can contact Justin Schiffler if you need to. I'll put a link uh, in the description to maybe your Facebook page or whatever. All right. So um, thanks for being on here. Yeah, thanks for having me. I'd, I'd love to talk more about just about honeybee density in an area and like um, one thing I want to point out. As a, a relatively newer beekeeper, listening to all the podcasts and stuff, treatment-free beekeeping conversations usually revolve around what they don't do rather than what they do do. Um, I was going to pick your brain if we had time about, like, you know, how often you you inspect your colonies and and how often you might do, uh, you know, like if you reverse brood boxes or not, or you know, things you do like that. Because um, I'm always trying to learn off of everybody and. The conversation usually isn't so much how to, right? Rather yeah. than what not to do. Um, yeah, I try to be careful doing not to do too much how to wing because I'm really just, I really don't consider myself, and I'm not really an authority on many things, especially beekeeping. It. I'm still learning so much every single day that I go out and mess with these bees. I learn something. Oh, that, and every that, year and doing cutouts and that's a great just, point that that someone brought up in one of um the clubs i belong to when they asked me to talk about something i think like thermal imaging or something like that for doing cutouts and i told them i didn't feel i have enough experience and they said well you don't have to come across as an authority just share what your experience and and what you have done and 
maybe what you have learned and then that you do differently now than what you, maybe you first did. And yeah, that, because, I think that would know, be so, that would be a good subject. I mean, if we could do could, that, well, let's plan that. We'll do that on our next one. I have a couple um, guests line up to do um, to have talks with, and then now we'll do another one. It, I think it went pretty well. Yeah, I always like talking bees. I know you like talking bees. <laughs> good stuff. <laughs> All right, so take care, and I'll see you on the next one. All right, thanks for having me. Okay, so to wrap up, if you have any feedback at all about this episode or any of the other ones, please just come talk to me over at the Might Bomb Beekeeping Facebook page or on my YouTube channel, which is PA Swarm King. I don't get any of the messages that people send through the podcasting platforms. So if you've been sending any messages there and I haven't responded to them, that's why. Uh, So I hope you enjoyed it and join me on the next one. Take care.